Thanks very much. Uh, I should say it gives me great pleasure after many, many years of absence to actually talk a little bit about the science of my spiritual home, which is the Victorian bush. I'm going to talk about multiple forest values and bushfire management, how they interact. And it's given from the perspective probably of an outsider looking in, since I haven't really done any fire research in Australia per se. And what I'll be talking about is firstly a few things about the values of the forests, then what bushfire management is, some of the issues with existing fire management. Uh, I should say that bushfire is a term used in Australia only. If you're overseas, you talk about fire management. And because most of my work has been overseas, I will uh, lapse into non-Australian terminology ever so often. I apologise. Um, and also, finally, with, with some recommendations of how this bushfire management can be improved. So firstly, values of forests. There are many ways you can evaluate values. This is one particular method, looking at direct, indirect values, option values, existence values, with a whole list of them uh, being given. If you're an economist, you can also talk about economic values of forests and splitting to use, non-use values. And again, direct use, indirect use, etc. Bequest existence values. There are many, many values of forest, but regardless of how you sort of classify forest values, the point is that if you're managing a forest, you have to somehow take into account these values. So let's go on and look at fire management. Um, okay, so the first definition of modern fire management really came from the US Forest Service in the late 1970s. And basically, fire management or bushfire management was an integration of various fire-related bits of information into land management to meet desired land management objectives. Later on, the FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, came up with a slightly more lengthy definition, but still involving similar things, a whole pile of activities associated with fire and how they're integrated into sort of meeting land management objectives. In Australia, we have a definition um, which is a bit simpler, but basically the activities associated with fire and how they can meet management, land management goals and objectives. In Victoria, we've recently had a, uh, bush, a draft bushfire management strategy released just this year, which defined bushfire management as simply the activities associated with fire. Nothing to do with land management, nothing to do with how they could be integrated with land management, nothing to do with um, the relationship to anything else that goes on in the land. Bushfire management was separate from everything else which I believe is one of the major problems with fire management in Victoria. Anyway, so talking about some basic principles of fire management, and I just put this image up here to show you that it's, fire management is conducted all over the world. It's not just unique to this part of the world. Um, the first important point is that it should be subordinate to land management. Land management dictates what you want from the land. Fire management is one component of that. You must have a fire management plan. You must use the best available science. And you must have or acquire knowledge of and evaluate a number of things. Um, fire behavior, fire effects, effects of all the activities you're doing, what's available, what your values at risk are. And in Australia also, I think it's important to consider and know something about indigenous fire knowledge. Now, we have in Victoria these bushfire management strategies which come out for different regions of the state, which are essentially something similar to a fire management plan. But what are the current issues? What are the major issues from my perspective, as I, as I said, more or less from, as an outsider, because I haven't been working intimately in the field here? Firstly, and you've you'll heard about this already, you'll hear more about it again, Past forest management, which includes both timber harvesting and fuel reduction burning, has increased <clears throat> forest flammability and the likelihood of more severe bushfires. 
Current fire management, from my perspective, is focused almost entirely on reducing fuel loads, primarily through prescribed burning. And most other values are ignored, um, human health's ignored, uh, land management objectives are ignored, fire management sits by itself. Um, we don't have a good knowledge of what's present in the forest that we're supposed to be managing. Current prescribed burning practice is not very good, it needs improvement. And since it's so dominant, it, it's worth commenting on. And also, finally, uh, the tools, well, not quite finally, but the tools that we have to assist fire management um, need improvement. They're not based on the best available science. And finally, there doesn't seem to be any control over bushfire management in Victoria. People who are conducting fire management can do whatever they want and there seems to be little recourse to do anything about it. So just looking at the first thing, and in front of me are people who know much more about this than me, but I'll just point out that typically many studies, not just one or two, but quite a few have shown that once you after a fire, the hazard's low, but then it builds up with time to a peak before it drops down again. And current fire management, burning every five, 10 years or whatever, keeps us on this high flammability situation. Which you see on the left, other studies have shown similar sorts of things. And forest harvesting, past harvesting, you've already seen this figure this morning. Uh, David Lindenmeyer showed it to you, pointing it out how Harvesting here, this in this case following the 2019-20 fires, has increased the likelihood of more severe crown fire type situations. Now, I'll just add to this a study that I've done in Canada a number of years ago in southwestern British Columbia, which found something very similar following forest harvesting. You see, initially there's a low crown fire hazard. It increases with time since harvesting and then drops off again, followed by a slight increase in old growth forests. Point is maximum period for uh, a crown fire likelihood, crown fires being the most serious, intense, severe type of fires we can get, typically occurs 20 to 70 years after harvesting in these coniferous forests in Western Canada. Similar results have been found in the Western US. The point is, I, I mention this not to promote this work, but to point out that there's been a lot of criticism of any study in Australia which uh, sort of comes up with results which contradict conventional belief. And, but this, the increase in, ha in fire severity likelihood after harvesting has been found elsewhere. It's not unique to Australia. So uh, one can't really criticise the Australian work as being something that's very special or different. It has occurred elsewhere. So we have these burning plans, and if you look through them, they say all the right things. <clears throat> However, in practice, uh, when you look at what's planned for the state, these are prescribed burns that are planned, fuel reduction burns for the next few years in the near future. The state's just riddled with them. Um, and in Victoria, uh, bushfire management strategies are dominated by the objective of, re of reducing this mythical thing called risk. And they've got these nice graphs which show what residual risk is as a function of time. Basically, if no forests were burnt, if everything was present, long unburned, you'd have 100% risk. And if you start burning things, then you reduce the risk. And according to this line that's appeared over the years, this is what's happened. Um, and of course, the strategy is to keep the risk below this 70% figure by burning or fuel reduction control, usually burning, which is in that green bar. And if you don't do it, then what's going to happen is the risk is going to follow that dashed line up to 100 again. Of course, with bushfires occurring, that'll never happen, but this is what the plan says. Now, the use of the word risk is a bit confusing anyway, because it's <laughs> The management plans talk about house loss, risk of house loss, as well as bushfire risk, and the two seem to be interrelated, but they're quite different things in practice. And risk is also determined using a computer model called Rapid, a Phoenix Rapid Fire, 
which basically treals, treats fuel quantity as synonymous or equivalent to risk. Now, Phoenix assumes that fuel increases according to what's called the Olsen model. In other words, it starts low after a fire and just increases perpetually with time until it flattens out at some high point, a long unburned state. Whereas more recent work, or well, recent work has shown that it doesn't really follow the Olsen model, it follows that solid curve. It peaks initially before dropping down afterwards. Okay, so what about um, lack of consideration of other values? This is a tree that was, when they, when they conduct fuel reduction burns, they want to make sure that trees don't fall on people conducting the burns, so they cut things down that they think will fall on them. This particular tree on the left was photographed with clearly visible uh, nest material coming out of a hollow. That tree was felled uh, shortly after the photo was taken. There were still two possums inside that hole, so the tree was felled while it actually had possums in it. Um, I lodged a complaint with the Office of the Conservation Regulator about this thing and it got nowhere. They couldn't do anything. Another tree that was felled, another hollow, that hollow also had nesting material inside it. And felling of old growth, hollow bearing trees in a national park is, has been occurring as part of the program to uh, tidy up fuel breaks. Um, these trees, pictured were not in the fuel break, they were adjacent, they were off 10, 20 metres off one side within the National Park. Um, they were living, they had hollows in them. You can see the bottom picture there, the tree was quite solid, there's not much rot in the middle of it, quite a sound tree. And this area was zoned basically for conservation and water production, this is within the Marooned catchment, and, uh, which is also part of Yarra Ranges National Park. And the, the management, primary management objective for that, for that area was to sort of maintain water and also to maintain the environmental quality. Um, another issue which was mentioned previously is salvage logging. This is an example of what has been happening in the Wombat State Forest. You saw earlier some photographs of what blowdown looked like, trees were blown down. Well, the solution to the problem, which it was considered that that was a big fire hazard, so they had to get rid of all that big material. And of course, the large logs don't contribute much to rates of spread of fire at all. It's the small materials that contribute to rates of spread. So by pulling off all the logs, you're actually probably enhancing the, the speed with which a fire would travel through the area. So from a fuel reduction perspective, it's... it's uh, it doesn't help the situation at all. Okay, uh, what about smoke? Um, the left top graph there is particulate matter, PM 2.5, particulate matter, small particles less than 2.5 microns in diameter. These are the ones that cause health problems. You can see a couple of peaky areas. One is around April, May 2018, which was entirely due to prescribed burns, fuel reduction burns. And you can see a satellite image down the bottom taken on the 1st of May. All that smoke you see to the, west, uh, to the east of Port Phillip Bay, that's all fuel reduction, prescribed fires. It's not from wildfire at all, a bushfire. The second big peaks obviously on that top graph from the, were from the um, bushfires 2019-20 summer fires. Okay, so that's smoke, but what happens elsewhere? In 2001, the US put out a 200 plus page document on what to do about smoke and how to manage it. Apparently those 200 pages haven't yet hit Australia. Uh, in BC, which I'm familiar with, um, I did some work on smoke management there. Uh, there's three different zones, basically close to communities, away from communities and a long way away. And each zone has some sort of rules about when you can't burn and when you should burn, depending on how well the smoke will be dispersed using something called the ventilation index, which is also measured in Australia, actually. Um, and a few days ago, that was what BC looked like in terms of where you could burn, where you could not burn, or if you could burn for more than a day. 
Uh, aesthetic values, another issue. Um, there's been a few studies looking at aesthetic values, what people think about fires in Australia, and basically the studies are consistent with work done elsewhere which show that people don't like intensely burnt landscapes. And they prefer unburnt landscapes, but intensely burnt are less preferable to lightly burnt. And studies have looked at scenic quality studies basically showing people images of different fire scenes or unburned scenes and saying, what do you prefer? Uh, in terms of other values, biodiversity, if we look at how many areas are long unburnt, uh, in different parts of Victoria, you've already seen pictures of sort of frequency of fires earlier, but basically, if you look at tolerable fire intervals, this is the time, the minimum time it would take for a plant to re be able to reproduce itself, to produce seed, etc., is the fire in tolerable fire interval for, for that plant. And a lot of that image there is red. In other words, it's below the minimum tolerable, tolerable fire interval. So another fire in that area uh, within that time would sort of uh, cause many species not to be able to regenerate. Just looking at <clears throat> ecological vegetation classes, different environments in eastern Victoria, uh, the blue part, this is the percentage of each different EVC that's been burned within a certain time period, the top, but the top graph being for the last 15 years. And the blue is due to bushfire, the orange is due to prescribed burns. So you can see the prescribed burning, particularly in the drier forests, which are the ones on the right, the cluster of forests on the right, the lower elevation ones, uh, has been adding quite substantially to the... Uh, amount of fire in those forests. And the minimal, the tolerable fire intervals basically come primarily from this publication in 2010, which listed different intervals for different types of vegetation or EVCs. And basically the thing was that for a high severity fire, it couldn't, the minimal, minimum tolerable fire interval was about 15 years plus was greater in the wetter forests, such as the ash forests. And a large chunk of those EVCs were, um, had been burnt within the last 15 years. So another more recent study there by Muir looked at one particular species, Banksia spinulosa, and found that the um, minimum tolerable fire interval for, for that species was actually greater than had been previously assumed. So when you start delving into individual species, you find that these minimum tolerable fire intervals may actually be greater than the ones we currently accept. Just a few quick comments about water and other value. Um, basically, if you look at what's been happening following a fire, there's this initial increase followed by a decrease, and those crosses in that figure represent um, actual measured values, and people have tried to model this by putting lines to it. You can see some lines there, different authors. But basically, um, the crosses are all over the place. It's not easy to predict. And the conclusion, one conclusion of a recent study was that it depends on how <clears throat> quickly um, forests thin out, which is not very easily predictable. Now, another study looking at drier mixed species forests found interestingly that a low severity fire increased the amount of evapotranspiration compared to a higher severity fire. Because the, the minimum, the lower severity fire enhanced plant growth for, to some extent, so there's more transpiration. The net result was that the higher severity fire actually caused <laughs> less. Uh, sorry, the lower severity fire caused less runoff than did the higher severity fire in that particular situation. We have things that are supposed to be done for fire management in Victoria. Basically, it's all focused around one particular thing, fuel reduction. If you look at causes of fires, you can see that lightning causes about 25% of fires in Victoria, 75% are caused by people, and of the area burnt about 45 is lightning, 55% is by people. And of people, um, 
deliberately lit fires, arson type fires, by 25% of all fires in the state and the second largest chunk of area burned. So that's the sort of thing that people, that fire management should be focusing on. Now just going on to an area that was supposed to be burnt, I said our knowledge was inadequate, we assessed this area, we came up with these things, the EVCs were incorrectly mapped over 25%, we found a number of endangered species in this area and there's a great variation in fuel types, forest vegetation, all of which is to be burnt at the same day. So a fire in all those different ecosystems um, presents problems. Okay, so we need to improve burning practices. Fires often escape. Um, prescriptions allow fires to escape because they're very broad. They don't consider smoke. They don't consider ecological impacts of what they're doing. Uh, studies showed that. And looking at Corinder bushland near Healesville, a fuel reduction or a, well, I don't know whether you call it ecological fuel reduction or whatever, but a prescribed burn in December 21 caused a lot of, well, basically the fire scorched all the leaves on the trees. Two years later, the trees are dead totally. Um, we need to use best available science the Olson model, as I said, used to forecast or predict fuel is incorrect. Various, not a single study has found the Olson model to be the accurate or correct model. Every study that's been done has found the opposite. And also it uses, um, Phoenix Rapid Fire uses this fire hazard guide to indicate what the fuel hazard is. I won't go into this in detail, but basically it's very subjective. Okay, um, there has been a very recent, only last week this came out uh, to try and improve the model, but there's still problems with it. But I guess one of the key problems is how much weight should you give to this dead fuel anyway if you're measuring it when it has little impact on, on fuel, on fuel hazard. Okay, little apparent control over management Victoria, I've mentioned this. Um, recommendations to improve, <laughs> This is my last slide. <laughs> we'll go through them all quickly. Basically, um, what I've said, integrating what I've said, if you implement these things, you will improve bushfire management in Victoria. But one of the key things, it should be subservient, subordinate to land management. The land management objectives should determine what you do. And there's a many things that you should be doing to improve it. Um, according to what I've just put up there. Tools need to be improved. Uh, the practice needs to be improved for fuel reduction burning. And if you are going to use fuel reduction burning, then try and emphasise lower intensity severity of patchy type fires, similar to indigenous burns. And um, if you're going to cut down trees, well, firstly, you, you should figure out what you've got before you do anything in, on a site. In, do inventories, which are not done, and you should always monitor the impacts. Okay, and um, I'll finish there. Thank you. That's a fuel reduction burn or ecological burn in the Northern Territory, Indigenous burn. Thanks.